I can hear you. Well, welcome back to Venture to Berg, Jan, and I wanted to introduce you to uh, Katie Gossip. Hi, Mr. Dorsey. How are you? Hey. Um, well, I am, as Mr. Burks introduced me already, I'm Katie. I'm a junior at Bishop Berg, and on the Academy of Advanced Studies, I would like to welcome you and to thank you for giving us your time and being willing to answer any questions that we might have. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you all. And I think my uh, my parents and maybe other members of my family there are too. Yeah. 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 Stand up. Stand up. No. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Tom Manning. And uh, as you can see, we have a rather large group of 71 of our academy students here, along with your mom and dad and some other sort of guests uh, willing to join in on our conversation. Uh, we have a number of questions that the students have uh, thought about carefully and would like to ask you. And if you're ready, we'll go ahead and start. Let's do it. All right. Karen, you're up. Um, hi, my name is Aaron Tucker. I'm a sophomore. And my question, Mr. Dorsey, is the going to, well, the being in St. Louis and going to Bishop Bird play a role in creating Twitter and how exactly? <laughs> um, I think uh, I, 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 everything you do in your life up to the point, um, especially for me, everything I did in my life up to the point where you created Twitter um, definitely play a role. Uh, it's hard to isolate exactly what and how. Um, but I would say that um, DeBerg has been in, in my family for quite some time. My father went there, my aunts, my uncles went there. Um, and it's been a big part of uh, the St. Louis community. And uh, I, I think the biggest thing that it gave me was really just a, a confidence in myself um, to, uh, to follow you know, whatever ideas I had, but also to realize that it wasn't just about having the idea, it was actually about working on the idea and building it. Um, and that's where things really get started, is actually in the work. So I think from many perspectives, you can see successes and you, and, and you say, well, I wish an, I had an idea like that. Um, but if you just focus on the idea, you're really missing, you're missing all, the, uh, all the work it took to get there. And it took years and even a decade to get where we are. Uh, today with Twitter and and also with Square, and I I want to say that we're stopping at any point either, um, which which is to say that you know I, I definitely don't see Twitter as um, the end all be all of my life. I see it as another learning opportunity, just like Bishop Bird was uh, to build bigger and better things uh, in the near future. Great question. Though. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from uh, Lauren. Lauren, would you like to ask a question? Hi, I'm Lauren. Hello. Um, I'm a senior at Bishop DeBerg, and my question is, what is one piece of advice you would give to a graduating senior? Um, I guess the, um, the thing I would have loved to hear the most uh, when I was your age is how um, how precious and how short our lives are, and to really focus on the on the time that you have, and it, you know it's it's something that doesn't feel like a stress or a pressure at, at your age. It certainly didn't for for me when I was in high school. Um, but making sure that you make every single day matter and you treat every single day as potential to to do something completely different or to do something really great, I think is, is important. And the more you just let days pass by you or let time pass by you, uh, you're really wasting your own opportunity um, and your own opportunity to solve real problems that the world has, but the world isn't getting as much as it uh, could be with you really focused on it as well. So um, I know it doesn't feel that way, but, but life is precious, life is short, and every single day matters and every single hour of that day matters. So um, make sure that you're always giving it your uh, your best. And, and that's what I would, would have loved to hear more uh, when, when I was your age. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, you have to ask your question? 
Hi, I'm Patrick. I'm a freshman here. Um, and my question is, did you expect Twitter to be this popular that is having it on pretty much every team's phone? <laughs> well, it's not on every team's phone yet. I think Snapchat is on every team's phone. Now. Uh, I, uh, you know, when when we when we started this, um, we we knew the we knew the idea was really big, and we knew that there was something there that felt really great, and that, and that's what I always look for is the thing that I'm working on, or the thing that I'm studying, or the thing that I'm passionate about or involved in, does it feel does it feel great? And that's really all we needed. Um, we didn't build it because we thought it was going to be huge. We built it because we wanted to see it and we wanted to use it. And that was enough for us. Um, just the fact that we could use it was, uh, was, was really important to us. And it turns out that as we showed more people, they wanted to use it as well. And uh, as they showed more people, those people wanted to use it as well. But Every person that came on used it in a slightly different way that we weren't expecting because everyone has a diverse perspective and, and brings their own uh, opinions and, and drive and character to the platform. And that, I think, has been the most powerful aspect of it is all we had to do was really build uh, a tool that could scale to as many people as possible. Just, and, and what that means is just stay up. And then people could come to it and make it their own. And sometimes making their own meant that they shared news. Sometimes it meant talking to their friend. Sometimes it meant that they would use it to discover music or what was happening around the neighborhood or in St. Louis. Um, sometimes they would use it for protests. And we didn't have to dictate any of that. Uh, people could actually come to it and they could, they could define what it is for themselves. And um, that is not something we were expecting at all. Um, but we're really proud and, and humbled that uh, the world has taken to it in that way. Um, but I think it shows, um, I think it really shows what the world wants to talk about, what the world cares about most. And I think it truly shows what humanity values the most. Uh, sometimes, it about, sometimes it values overthrows of governments, sometimes it values whether a dress is white or gold or blue and black. <laughs> um, and, and that's who we are. You know, we have to have, uh, we have, to have those extremes. Um, and I think those are important because that's, that's what humanity is. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question here. Uh, Emma? Hi there. I'm Emma, and I'm a high school senior. Um, Hi, Emma. <laughs> um, being an original thinker and having so many of your innovative thoughts come to fruition, what do you think the future holds in terms of technology? Well, first, I think anytime we talk about the word technology, technology can become a square, scary word. That's kind of the word innovation. I don't think true innovation and true invention actually happens with one person sitting in a room and thinking. It happens by one person sitting in a room, deciding that they're going to do something, deciding that they're going to actually work on the idea, and then bringing other people into the fold. And as you actually work on the idea, you discover new things. You discover things that you were expecting. And that, um, that really moved forward. So the, the first thing I would say is, let's make sure that we're focusing on the ideas that you have. And if you feel passionate about them, then get them out of your head and start working on them. And then show other people, and if they just feel passionate for them as well, then you know maybe you can start something and, and build something together and collaborate. Um, but the more we the more we talk about um, technology and and innovation as these abstract terms, the, the less we, we do something about it. So we, we actually have to work and we get out there. Um, the second part of your question, where these tools go, um, I think is interesting. What I'm seeing this year, and what I'm really excited about, and, and you kind of kind of just look at what people are using and what they want to what they want to see. Um, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of motion around live video uh, this year. I think people are. 
people are getting more having more and more expectations around seeing video everywhere and they're having more and more expectations around everything being live and being real time and in the moment. Um, and unfortunately the technology over the past 15 years really hasn't been available or um, ready for people to, to actually uh, show live video and, and do live broadcasting, but I think that's changing. I think our cell phone networks are are such that people can now do that. I think the data plans are still expensive, but they're coming down. Um, and the phones and the devices that we're carrying around uh, make it easier and easier and more accessible for people to, uh, to, to participate in that. And it's not yet as accessible as it should be, but it's getting more and more so. And then the second big technology that I think is interesting is, um, is voice and dictation specifically. Instead of typing using your, your voice to actually uh, write an email or to write a text message or to write a letter or a paper, I think it's getting really, really good now. And I've been using uh, voice to um, text, uh, text my mom every morning. Uh, and it's just become something that uh, is a lot easier and a lot more correct. So I, I think we'll see a lot more technologies around voice. And then the third is probably around healthcare as well, and specifically preventative healthcare. So our, our devices have a lot of our sensors in them. They can tell us uh, what we're doing and maybe even what we should be doing more of or doing less of. I think it's going to be a big year for, for that as well. Yeah. My question for you is, um, what is your best memory of Bishop DeBerg? Uh, best memory of Bishop DeBerg? Um, probably, um, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, but probably my industrial, uh, my mechanical drawing class. Um, I, uh, you know, we, we were just allowed to be, obviously we had to do our work around some mechanical illustration and very, very technical. Uh, work, but we're also allowed to be super creative around drawing, drawing portraits and whatnot. And what I learned there was just the, the fine balance between uh, art and precision, and where those two intersect. And um, I think there was a lot of uh, a lot of freedom in, in all my classes at, at Bishop DeBerg that allowed me to explore my creativity more. Thank you. Uh, question from uh, Amanda. Hello, I'm Amanda. Hello. My question for you is, is there anything about Twitter that you don't like? <laughs> um, is there anything about Twitter that I don't like? I mean, there's, cert there's certainly uses of Twitter that uh, are not uh, the most positive, or fairly negative. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important for the world to see the negative activity in the world so that we at least have a conversation about it and we can choose to diminish it, not just on a technology, not just on Twitter, but actually diminish it in the world. Um, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, we can actually see a full picture of the world and not just, uh, not just parts of it. And I think that's really important. Um, because I, I do think we need to have more conversations about what is really positive and what moves us forward and what's really negative and, and what blocks us from, uh, from actually connecting together more um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and seeking more, more peace in the world. So there's not a lot that I don't, that I don't love about it, but you, know, you look at some uses of it and you're like, oh, well, that's not very... Uh, that's not very nice, and that's that's fairly negative. But I, I do think it's important that at least we see it so that we can start uh, uh, really addressing it. Thank you. We have another question here from Javier. Hello, my name is Javier, and uh, I'm a senior here at Bishop Burke. I wanted to ask, what did you do to get other people excited about your ideas? It's a great question. Um, I think the, the thing that works the most is when you have something to show. 
So when we talk about ideas, when you talk about an idea to your friend or to your parents or to your sister or your brother, um, you know that the response is like, cool, great. You know, but when you actually show something that's working and that they can see and they can experience and that they can feel, uh, it really inspires their imagination. So with uh, with Twitter, I didn't really, I didn't really talk about the idea as much as I, I wanted to show it off. And when we went to investors, or when we went to hire employees, we would actually show how people were using the service and, how, and what people were doing with it. When we, um, when we made Square, we didn't show anyone uh, until we had a working prototype, until we could actually swipe someone's credit card and take money from their credit card. And this was the best thing to show ever, because I could go around to people and say, do you want to see my you know, my new idea, and they would say, yeah, and I would say, give me your credit card. And they would say, no, and I would say, well, I'm not going to show you my idea then. And depending on the card they gave me, I would take anywhere from a dollar to five hundred dollars. And uh, I got a lot of dinners from, from that demo. So I think the, the thing that, um, that gets people passionate about your ideas and um, get them excited to maybe help you or to work with you or to invest in you or to just collaborate or give give their opinion is when they can actually see something or more importantly use it um, So it's really important to get to a state where again, it's not just the idea but you've actually done work and that work is is, is a, Well, and uh, other people can actually it's so visible that other people can have an opinion about it and those opinions about it are extremely important uh, to hear because they make they make everything that you're doing better because you want that diverse perspective on how people think about your work versus um, how you think about your work. Thank you. Uh, David? <coughs> Hi, I'm David. I'm a freshman here at Bishop and Burke. My question for you is, what would you say was the biggest decision in your life that caused you to get to where you are today? Um, these are always tough ones because I don't, I, I see this as a series of decisions that may not have felt right at the time but actually worked out. Um, and I, I, I can't really point to any, any one in particular that uh, has made me who I am today. Um, but I think, the, I think the thing that's helped me most is recognizing um, when a decision needs to be made, and uh, and really just being aware of why I'm making it. I think I think why the question why is one of the most important tools that I've used in my life um, because it always leads to something that allows me to discover something about myself or about the world. Um, it's a funny thing because it's one of the easiest questions to ask, which is why kids do it to their parents all the time, or, or you as, as uh, older brothers or sisters, you know, your little brothers or little sisters or little nieces or nephews are always asking, you know, why is the sky blue? Why is the ocean blue? Well, you know, why, why does this work this way? Or why does this work this way? And it's easy to, um, to answer that in a way that shows frustration. Well, that's just because the way it was made, or that's what science says, or that's what, uh, that's how it is, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> But the people that can actually sit with that question and continue to go down and answer why when the other why comes and the next why comes and the next why comes, eventually getting to the answer, I don't know. When you get to that answer, I don't know, that's an open door to actually explore and to be curious and to, um, uh, and to find an answer. And it may not be an answer, but it's going to be your answer. and. Uh, and your answer may ultimately be the answer. It's really what you what you make of it. So, you know that 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 tool of asking why does this work this way or why does it have to be this way, and answering it for yourself and constantly as you have an answer, go one level deeper and say why again and say why again. And having that unend unending curiosity will always lead you to something uh, something strong. So. Anytime I've decided to, to really push myself uh, to continue to answer that question and arrive at an I don't know where I, I now do a bunch of work to 
to change that I don't know to an answer uh, has been a great decision for me. Thank you. Uh, Tim? Hi, uh, I'm Tim Greer. I'm a junior here at Burt. I want to know what is the most frustrating part of your job? <laughs> um, what was the most frustrating part of my job? Uh, I guess the few things, but it, it always comes back to um, we, you know, we're we're building we we built some really exciting things, and it's always frustrating to have to keep it inside for a while because it's not ready to go out. So. Um, you get really excited by what we see uh, inside uh, the company and also really impatient for it to be out in the world. And um, in our worst moments, the impatience has gotten to us uh, and we pushed something out way too early and it just wasn't right and ultimately um, that creates a failure. And in our best case, we realize that we need to be patient and we need to work a little bit more, and we need to keep it inside more. And it's going to be frustrating because it's really exciting. We're, we love using it, and, and we can't wait for other people to use it as well and see what they do with it, but it's just not there yet, and it's just not ready. And I think if you can if you can practice at this point, then you can get really, really good at being patient, recognizing the appropriate time for something, um, you'll, you'll be really successful. And that's not just in in work or uh, in creative endeavors, uh, it's also in, in relationships as well. So I think timing is, is really important. There's a, there's, a, there's a sense that a lot of entrepreneurs and, and people like me are just really, really lucky. Um, and I don't think it's as much about being lucky as it is as being aware of when a fortunate situation is right ahead of you or about to be ahead of you and being prepared enough that you can actually take it and that you can actually act on it and you can move fast. So the more you spend preparing yourself and, and working hard and um, and really being a patient, being patient for the right time to come, uh, the more successful and um, the more you'll do that you, you, you will feel great about. It. And it probably resonates with Okay, thank you. Um, Zoe, question? Hi, I'm Zoe, I'm a sophomore. Hi, Zoe. Uh, my question is, um, in your opinion, how is Twitter changing society in our current generation? Well, um, I think, uh, I think communication is fundamental and Twitter is a, is a different way of communicating. It's a funny thing because if you, um, Square was a company that people had a real need around. So there was a real problem. People could not everyone could accept credit cards. And when Square came out, it made sense. Like, yeah, I really need that. Uh, Twitter is not a problem that anyone had. Uh, no one in the world was saying, "Wow, I really wish I could, you know, wake up and open an app and speak in 120, 140 character verse. I really need that in my life." No one, no one said that, right? Um, but when people saw it and when, and when they started using it, um, there, there was an appreciation and acknowledgement of uh, its immediacy, of its constraint, uh, and of its ability to really show uh, very disparate parts of the world. So I think from a, from a very um, idealistic and uh, abstract standpoint, I think it's the closest thing we have to a global consciousness. I think you know the, the fact that I can open my phone and I can see what's happening at any part of the world, uh, even places I've never visited or I don't have any acquaintances in, um, places like Iran uh, during the, the green uh, election revolution, uh, where I had no context with the people who lived in Iran, but suddenly they were on the ground tweeting about this protest and sharing videos, and I could actually see them without going through a mediated channel such as a CNN or uh, a news broadcast network. I could actually see them directly. And I think that's one of the biggest shifts. Is it, it's bringing immediacy 
and also a connectedness that it makes the world feel very, very small. Um, and I think that's really, really important, especially in the heart mind. The world feels smaller and smaller, um, so that we, you know, develop more empathy from it. So that's that's from an you know an idealist standpoint. Um, from a from a pure tool and technology standpoint, I think you know it's equivalent to word of mouth. And we've been talking for ages and ages and ages and telling stories for ages and ages and ages. And Twitter is it's yet our our next evolution and our next best tool uh, for getting the word out fast and uh, allowing as many people as possible to get some value from it, get some meaning from it. And who knows what, what they'll do with it. One of the, one of the things that um, we kind of got a lot of flack about in the early days is when people first saw Twitter, back to that concept of no one woke up and said, I really need, I really need Twitter in my life. Um, people would diminish it by saying, well, you know, all Twitter is is people updating about what they have for breakfast. And why does anybody need that? And my response was, well, you know, I, uh, I tweet about what I have for breakfast. And you're right, most of the world doesn't care. Most of the world thinks it might be stupid. Most of the world doesn't want to see my breakfast tweets. Um, but there's one person in the world that does want to see that I'm eating breakfast and reading my breakfast tweets, and that's my mom. Um, my mom likes knowing that I'm eating, and she likes uh, knowing that I'm alive, and she likes reading me in that way. So I think it's less about um, what you're writing and more about who is receiving it and what they do with it and how they value that. And who is to say how someone values uh, one tweet versus another person values that same tweet? It's very, very different. So um, I think that's been uh, been really cool and, and really important to see. Okay. Hey, thank you, Colleen. Question? Hi, Colleen. Um, I have a question about the Twitter um, well, it's probably no surprise, but I was in the uh, computer club, and, uh, and I was just getting started um, when, when I joined, um, and I played uh, tennis, and uh, I was on the, uh, I was proud that I was on the, on the varsity team, and it wasn't because I was any good at tennis, it was just because that's the only team we had. <laughs> so, um, but it, it made me feel good nonetheless. So, uh, those. I think that's. I think that's about it. That's that's what I remember. Uh, maybe we we'll get one more in here, Claire. Hi, I'm Claire. Uh, I have a question about the Twitter space. Uh, my mom is my favorite person to follow on Twitter, and I guess you follow the bird. I have to say, that's what I also was on Twitter. We're running, uh, unfortunately, out of time here, uh, but we'd like to uh, ask uh, whether or not you have any questions for us that we could possibly answer. Um, yeah, I mean, what's what's the most exciting thing in the bird you said? I mean, I would, I would ask the question, what high school did you go to, but I already know. <laughs> you know, for me, the most exciting thing I'm going on for Berg right now is Mr. Burks. He's an awesome teacher. Oh. He's giving me McDonald's almost like once a week. It's great because I'm a med tech aide and I get those privileges, so. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> The most, I think, the most important thing is uh, is is our teachers. So if you have, if you have great teachers, it makes all the difference. And I think I think you all do. Well,
I want to personally thank you very much for your time. I, I took a lot of the schedule this, and I realize you're very busy. Uh, I saw you a couple years ago at Webster University getting an award, and at that time I knew I really wanted you to come and talk to the Academy. Uh, I'm sure everybody here thanks you for your time, and I'm hoping they're going to applaud now. Woo! Thank you. Enjoy. Bye-bye.